give me the presentation to start. Yeah, so just one more second to fix it. No, changing equipment for the first time. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Just throw some food up here, and then while I'm eating it, you can talk to Vlada. <laughs> um, but uh, my, my, my research, I, really there's two big areas that I do research and teaching. One is the idea of public space, right? what it means to have a street, a square, a public realm in which you have citizenship, in which you, you live together in a society with other people. The other thing I'm really interested, interested in is dreams of utopia, right? dreams of a better world, dreams of progress and the future. And uh, when those two things combine, you get some really interesting problems and really interesting possibilities, too, I think. Uh, and if you will leave it here. Oh. To stand on from when I'm really angry. Because yeah. I, I get angry in this, in this project, actually. This project is a little bit of a an anger project for me. Um, you know, I mean, the, the reason I, I started doing research into cars and into General Motors is because, you know, probably if you've been to the United States or even if you've seen a lot of movies about the United States, you might have noticed that Americans drive all the time for everything. You know, may, not in New York, right? In New York, people walk around. But in Los Angeles and most cities, you have to drive every day to live, right? And when I was growing up in the United States, even though it was normal to me that my mother had to put me in the car and drive me for anything, for milk, we have to drive. For chocolate, we have to drive. To go to school, drive. To play, drive. To do anything, we have to drive. And even then, when I was a kid, I didn't like it. Right? But I, th I thought it was normal, but I didn't like it. And then I came to Europe, specifically to Dresden in Germany. And I saw the trommy. And I thought, oh, that trommy is wonderful. And I had a walking street. I could have a beer in one hand and a sandwich in the other hand and walk everywhere. And it was magic. It was absolutely magic. And I, and I got back to the United States and I asked my history professors, why don't we have this? Why don't we have trommies? Why don't we have walkable cities that are complex and rich with, with different people living together and shops and homes? And, and they said, America is too new. It's too new. Our cities are too young for all of this. But they were lying. They didn't know that they were lying, but I looked at old photographs. Because most of our cities, we're not very old, but most of our cities are 100 years old now, right? or, or more. The city I live in now is about 400 years. And I looked at the old photographs, and we used to have a lot of charmies. We used to have rich, dense, complex cities where everything was close together, and you had you know, shops and homes and everything. You used to be able to walk everywhere. And then it was destroyed. It wasn't destroyed by bombs. It wasn't destroyed by the Germans. Right? It was, we destroyed it ourselves. And I wanted to know how my grandmother and my grandfather would destroy their own city and turn it into something very different. And that's why I started doing research into the automobile and the suburb and the destruction of the American public realm. Right? So food, clothing, shelter, car. Those are the four things you have to have to live in the United States. You can, if you don't have those four, you're going to die, right? So um, is there a clicker? I, I will be the clicker. Oh, right. Vlada, please, one click. Right. <laughs> All right, so just a little background. Um, throughout a lot of the 20th century, car companies, automobile companies, got very, very involved with architecture and with urban planning. They sponsored the creation of a large number of really amazing visions of future cities, utopian cities, futuristic cities, beautifully modern, radiant cities full of light and electricity and machines. And not just car companies, but tire companies, aluminum companies, petroleum companies, companies that had anything to do with the automotive industry got engaged in the architecture and urban planning business. And nobody more than Nobody more than, can you go back one slide anyway? Yeah. 
In fact, there's so few of us, we could probably just use this computer. Yes, yes, yes. Just put the computer right here and then everybody gather around. Hey, hey, hey. Okay, back in business, back in business. Hey, there it is. Okay. So you see, you see that building, right? All right. Uh, out of all these companies that got all these car companies and gas companies and tire companies, the biggest one was General Motors. They invested an incredible amount of money in their urban planning visions. Huge amounts. Millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? And uh, they were the biggest corporation in the world when they were doing this. So this is, this is real power, okay? So I need to give you a little more background. Uh, next slide, please, Lena. So the, the love affair between um, automobile industry and, what about the, okay, the automobile industry and modern art and modern architecture, it really was a love affair. Like it went both ways. Um, and a lot of modern artists, early modern artists and architects like the Italian futurists argued that the motor car was the new god and that art should turn to the motor car. They said that, that the motor car was more beautiful than the winged victory of Samothrace. Right? The motor car was even more beautiful than a machine gun, the Italian futurists argued, which says a lot about their obsession with destruction and their, their obsession with the, 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 the power of modernity to completely break and shatter the old existing world. Um, and uh, architects like Mies van der Rohe would, you know, attempting to sell his architecture, he would bring in a car and a picture of a girl whose father isn't paying any attention, right, to what she's doing that day, uh, in an attempt to, to demonstrate that his architecture offered a complete break with tradition, real liberty, real freedom, right? Of course, more freedom for the man. She's a part of the man's fun that day, just like the car, just like the building. This is a very macho way to treat uh, this uh, vision of the future, but the automobile is central, right? Again, it offers a rupture from the, from the past, a violent break with tradition, and also liberty, even liberty to engage in some questionable behaviors. And uh, Le Corbusier argued that the automobile was the only authentic cultural product. I wonder if even the space bar, eh, there it is. Le Corbusier argued that the automobile was the only authentic cultural product in modern times. That if, that if you looked at the Parthenon, the Parthenon's great, it evolved over many years and naturally, so did the automobile, he argued, and architecture needed to forget the Parthenon and become more like the automobile, evolving in this natural, organic manner. And he uh, described his buildings, as a result, as machines for living, right? He attempted to, again, demonstrate the, the sympathies, to demonstrate that his buildings were, were just like cars, except that they were for living instead of driving. And he also tried to formulate cities, which were machines for, for living, such as his famous Plan Voisin. Have you heard of this thing, the Plan Voisin? It was Corbusier's plan to destroy Paris, right? And replace Paris with a landscape of skyscrapers. And you'll see that road in the middle, that's a, what we call a limited access, high speed freeway. It is a fast road. It's a road you can't put a person on. It's only for cars. And it's super fast. And he would blow this thing right through the heart of Paris. Now, uh, pl the Plan Voisin, it's called the Plan Voisin because uh, the Voisin car company paid for this. The Voisin car company paid Le Corbusier to design this vision to destroy Paris. Right? Because the Plan Voisin knew what it, what it meant. It meant that you would buy a lot more cars. It meant that you would use the cars you bought a lot more often. So again, you see that already this love affair between modern architecture and, and the automobile industry, like they're already sleeping together, folks. And they're, they're trying to have babies. Okay? 
So, and Henry Ford, the American car company, knew what this would do as well. He argued that the automobile should be used to destroy the American city. He hated cities. He called cities diseases. Right? Because you have white people and black people living together. You have Jews and Christians living together. He hated that idea. You need to separate everything. Put all the white people houses over there and all the black people houses over there. Fewer if possible. Separate the Jews and the Christians and everybody can drive to work in the industrial factory um, on a Monday. Right? But the, the city itself should be destroyed. Right? So this is the guy we're going to be talking about mostly today. Right? When Charles Kettering became one of the major leaders of the General Motors Company, he inherited the, all of this discourse. Right? Modern architects were already flirting with the car companies, working with them, and then the car companies were already flirting with the modern architecture. Charles Kettering uh, was, a, was a genius of marketing. His, his goal was to get inside of your head. He wanted to be able to control what you want, how you imagine the future, how you imagine the present, what you see. He said famously, my job is to make you unhappy with what you have. I want you to be dissatisfied with your life so that you will buy a car. That's the goal. And not just a car, but the best, shiniest, coolest car you can possibly afford and that you will use it every day and then buy another one. And this is, this is very important because his, his next idea, and it, this idea was, was cooked up in all of General Motors, was called dynamic obsolescence. I'll tell you what that means. It means that you don't buy the new car when your old car breaks, right? You buy the new car when the new car is ready and you sell your old car. Does that sound familiar? Right? Do we use these until they break? Sometimes, if you drop it, you know, but most of the time, you trade it in for the new one. They were the first people to argue that. And the reason they, one of the reasons they argued that is because in 1929, the world economy collapsed. Right? And they believed that with this idea of dynamic obsolescence, where you always buy the new car, whether you need it or not, that that will keep the industrial program going, that will keep the industrial economies moving, and no more economic crisis, no more problems. Everybody just consuming, 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 eat, 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 drive, 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 drive. Everybody's rich, everybody's happy, no problem. That's his vision. And to make that, uh, make that happen, you have to combine dynamic obsolescence with what he called the fourth necessity. He said, I want to make the car number four. Food, clothing, shelter, car. And he knew that to do that, it wasn't just about selling cars, it wasn't about making the cars really shiny, he, he, you have to do that. It wasn't just about making them super modern and sexy and futuristic, yes, you have to do that. But he knew he had to change everything. Because at this time, in the American city, you can walk, you can buy a beer, you can have a sandwich, you can have your, your apartment over the, over the shop, and then you can take the tram wherever you want. He knew we have to destroy this to make the car the fourth necessity. And he began to think about how. So in 1933, Chicago has a huge World's Fair, right? the century of progress. It's one of the many attempts in the United States to shake off the fears. There's real fear about this economic collapse. Right? In Europe, you have the, the growing, the, the continued rise of Bolshevism, and you also have the rise of fascism. And in the United States, there's a growing number of communists, there's a growing number of fascists, and people are worried that the economic crisis is going to tear the country apart. And so you have a, no a number of events designed to kind of try to formulate a new way of looking at the future, a hopeful way, even though everybody's poor and the, the economy is completely broken and the government is in bad shape. So General Motors um, decided to, to sponsor an enormous exhibit, bigger than any of the national exhibits, bigger than Italy's, bigger than, the, uh, than Great Britain's, bigger than, bigger than America's, right? This was the biggest uh, exhibit at the fair. And that's one of the reasons they did this is because they know that people are mad at them. Because this idea of dynamic obsolescence, this idea of buy a new car every time we make one, it sounds really cool until you're poor and you've lost your job and you blame the big industries, the big companies for the crisis. Just like we blamed the banks for the last crisis, everybody blamed these guys for, the, for that one. 
So they realized they have to make people love them again. So they set up this huge fair, and they had this big, f wonderful, futuristic, super modern, shiny, full of light uh, hallway in which they talk about the worker. We love our workers. We love workers. Workers are the best. We do this for the workers. We love workers. Come in, and then on the next slide, and then they, the main exhibit was a working assembly line, a real one, where people would watch from the top as, as workers made cars in these nice clothes, and then the cars would drive away. And, every, and the public loved it. They re, and General Motors realized, we did it. We succeeded. There was a big gap, a big hole between us and the public, and we've bridged that hole. We're, they now feel closer to us again. We, we seem human to them again. So this is working. We need to keep this up. They also had a lot of science exhibits. Exhibits where they would show you how to break light into all the different colors or how to make metal float with magnets. And people loved all this stuff. Right? They just loved it. So they decided they needed to take their exhibit out of Chicago and take it to every town in the United States. Because really, it's a national problem. And so they come up with this idea they call the Parade of Progress. It's a, mobile, it's a mobile exposition that can go in every little town in the country. And they don't go to big cities. They go to all the little towns. And some of these towns still don't have electricity. Right? Some of these towns are really poor, small farming communities. And when General Motors brings their circus of science, and it's free, and you can come and look at these technological exhibits, and you can come and look at their how they make cars, then... It, everybody will talk about this for two years, three years. It's the biggest thing to happen in the town. Bigger than Christmas, right? So uh, all the newspapers reported, General Motors is bringing the exposition. It's bringing the circus of science. It's not about selling cars. It's about education. It's about hope. It's about optimism. And General Motors designed these incredibly futuristic, amazing, streamlined vans that almost look like aircraft, right? These things look like they're designed to go faster than light. And then they take, they would parade into town. They would work with all the, uh, the local high schools and the local government and have a big parade with all the kids going bang, bang, and smash, smash, and coming down the front, coming down Main Street. And then the mayor would be there to shake hands with General Motors. And the local guy who sells cars would also be there, right, saying, hey, don't forget me. I'm just a little guy, but don't forget me. And uh, they would set up outside of churches, outside of high schools, on the little village green, on the commons, uh, next to uh, maybe uh, the sporting events. And if one of those giant vans had a little mistake coming down these big streets, already you can hear what, how General Motors is working. They would say, oh, don't worry, don't worry, your town will be better soon. It's not the fault of General Motors. It's not the fault of this enormous, ridiculous machine. It's because your poor, shitty little town is too small and old to take the joy of modern General Motors. But don't worry, you'll get there eventually. Keep working, your town will enter the future, we hope. Right? So then they would set up, oh, could you go back one second? They would set up their, the vans to create a little court, and they would have a huge tent, and inside of that tent, General Motors exec executives, oops, can you go back one, sorry. General Motors executives would stand up there and give big talks. Again, they're not selling cars. They don't say, we make the best cars, come buy our cars. No, no, that, no, they're smarter than that. They get up and say, don't worry, America has a future. Your little town, oh, did I say little? Your nice town is a ha also has a future, and it's because of science and technology and industry, and we're going to grow together. We're going to solve the economic crisis together. We're all doing this together through science, right? Uh, and then they, uh, inside the streamliners, those big vans, they had a bunch of little exhibits, just like in Chicago, can you click it? Oh, sorry, that's okay. Um, for example, one of them, uh, which would have a guy talking into a microphone, and then you could see the voice. It's really exciting, huh? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, my God. These people, these people are, are gods. 
Right? And then you would have another one that shows a piece of metal floating in the air because of magnets. Holy smokes, that is unbelievable. And then over there, you have a guy cooking an egg with paper between the pan and the thing. I, don't, I actually don't know how that works, to be honest. But, <laughs> but it's, it's, oh, it's, um, these people are gods. They are not human. This is, this is not science. This is magic. They can do anything. I'm so embarrassed our town was too small for the bus. Uh, and then, this is where it gets really interesting. They also have some architecture exhibits, right? They show the old, the old living room of, from, the, from 1900, and then they show the new one, the living room of today, with science furniture and technology tables and modernism everywhere, glorious, splendid modernism. And above, they're so smart. What's the best way to make an old room gross? It's to talk about your parents kissing in it, right? That we're father wooed mother. That's disgusting, right? So it just makes everybody go, oh, no, I don't want that. Give me the modern one. All right. Um, and they also had, and this is where, I'm, where my work kind of comes in, um, visions of cities, the city of today, your nice little town, and the city of tomorrow, the General Motors town. And tomorrow, you'll see the picture. <laughs> it's okay. Uh-oh. That, that's actually good enough. That's cool. Oh, there it is. So on the left, you have the, the city of tomorrow. And these were large, large exhibits with moving parts, right? They have, they have me mechanical vehicles going back and forth, and the buildings would have little lights and stuff like this. Remember, some of these towns still don't have electricity. This is amazing, right? And so you have the cars going super fast. See that modernist skyscraper on the left with the glass? It's like glass. And then there's an airplane on top. Oh my goodness. And then over here on the, whoopsie. It's, it's over there on the right. Yeah, yeah. You, you, have the, you have the town of today, oh, uh, which is to say a normal American town. And look, you see the tram? You see the little tram? When that thing, when, when that part moved, it went like this. <laughs> Across the model. These things just go whoosh the car so fast so fast tram <laughs> glass brick steel wood new old car tram you get it and the newspapers when they talked about this they didn't just say oh General Motors is comparing transportation no they understood the city of yesterday they don't only say the city of today. It's supposed to be the city of today, but they don't see it that way. They say the city of yesterday and the city of tomorrow. Which one are you going to live in? Which one are you going to build? The old one with the trams and the, and the brick buildings? Or are you going to build the one with the glass and the airplane and the really fast cars? Um, now, every time they left the city after they set up their amazing show and got everybody to look at their models, um, they put an advertisement in the local paper. We hope we set a boy to dreaming. Always a boy. Always a white boy. Um, but the idea is that, and this is why, again, this is Kettering, right? He knows, he wants to get inside your head. He doesn't want you to think, oh, he just wants me to buy a car. He knows that's a problem. He wants you to think, we're doing this together. General Motors wants me to have a dream. I'm going to dream with General Motors. We're going to dream about the future. It's going to be beautiful, and I'm going to help. I'm going to be a part of this change. My little old town might be little today, and it might have trams on it, and it might be embarrassing, but tomorrow I'm going to make a difference. So at this time, Kettering starts reading into more modern architecture. He starts giving lectures to the civil engineering profession. He starts giving lectures to architecture groups, and he's promoting some of these really cutting-edge uh, modernist urban planning visions like Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City, which is basically Henry Ford's idea. You don't have a city. Everybody has a house in the country, and you drive to your factory in the country. No more city. No more problem. And then he also really, of course, fell in love with Le Corbusier's uh, vision, um, the, uh, the Plan Voisin, uh, which is the next slide, it, all in good time. Um, and 
Well, you saw that one already. So, and, and, exact, and again, he knows, right, at this time, the United States doesn't build roads. The government doesn't build roads, right? All the railroads are private. A lot, if there are only a few large highways, and they're actually mostly private or state-run, the federal, the main national government doesn't build roads. And where roads are being built, they're starting to be built in Germany by the Nazis, and the Autobahn, right, the Autobahn system is very famous. It connects city to city. But what the Autobahn does not do is it doesn't go through the city. It doesn't go into the heart of the city, into the old part of the city. And that's why Kettering loves much more. He, he doesn't like the Autobahn system. He likes Frank Lloyd Wright's idea, and he likes Corbusier's Plan Voisson, uh, Plan Voisson, because, as you remember, the Plan Voisson put a highway right through Paris. That's what he wants. Is it a little frozen? Is it, do you think it's because the file is too big? I'll try to switch to PDF. Okay. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So, any, any questions? Yours is much bigger than Ford. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Cars. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, exactly. And they, they kill the electric stuff. They kill it because they have too much involved in the gas industries. But yeah, Chrysler is getting in, in the, uh, also in the planning business. Chrysler, th there's a Harvard uh, city planner who argues the car should always be second to, to the human, to the pedestrian. Streets should be made for pedestrians first, square should be made for pedestrians first, and cars second. Then Chrysler starts sponsoring his research, and he completely changes. Cars are the most important thing. Cars are, oh, thank you, Chrysler. Thank you for that. I'll just put that over here. Cars are more important than people, and cars should be uh, the first priority in all design, because people will find a way, but cars need our extra care. So, you know, Ford, Henry Ford has, of course, always been talking about destroying the city, so nobody had any questions about his, his opinions. But all, all of these companies are getting involved. Um, and not just the car companies. What, one of the things I said in the beginning is that the uh, associated industries, so the, the petroleum industry, I'm going to talk about Shell in a minute, Shell Motor Oil, um, and uh, even the glass industry, but also the petroleum industry, the tire industry, Goodyear and Firestone, they're sponsoring modernist plans. So, I mean, they're all into it. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Sometimes if you go to view full screen, it might. So maybe really let's turn it. What? What do you mean turn it? What? Use this. Oh, yeah. Then it will be even more difficult for me, Daniel, to, to talk because he will not see. Oh, I can see it there. <coughs> I could try. You want me to try? I mean, I, I, I could try to do it without pictures. Ah, but the, the future liner. Yeah, no, no. the future is. The future is. The future is. <laughs> It, it's my fault for bringing a. I brought a huge file. Yeah. 
It's on the desktop. They took it off my USB. The USB is not plugged in, so. If we sacrifice the small bird to the computer god, would that work? <laughs> there was a cat. There was a cat. And it's not, not really black. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Or we just do it like this. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it like that. Can I see? Can we bring it? Come along. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay. So at at the at I, I'll just blow through this. At the same time. Science fiction magazines for kids are starting to publish full, like actual modernist urban designs games in the United States. So little kids are reading Le Corbusier at night with, with a flashlight probably and a blanket like this. And then mommy, doom, doom, doom. Are you sleeping? Yes, mother. And they're actually reading this formal like Bauhaus architecture. It's unbelievable in the science fiction magazines. And if you look at this image, you can see that the science fiction magazine imagines that Le Corbusier's city of tomorrow will have super fast cars and right next to the highway you're going to have lunch. You're going to sit at the table and eat a sandwich and that's going to be nice. Right next to the roaring freeway. It just goes to show you these people don't know what they're doing. They have no idea what this life is going to be like. It's, it's, everyone is confused. So General Motors then in 1938, they send the Parade of Progress after it's been to every town in the country, like every single little town. It's a big country. They've been to Cuba. They've been to Canada. They've been to Mexico. They're going everywhere for two years. They're just traveling all the time, showing their, showing their displays. They then go to New York in 1938 and have a very special show because the next World's Fair is about to begin. 1939, the New York World's Fair. The, the, the theme is building the world of tomorrow. It's another effort to get out of the crisis. The crisis is still going. It's, it's been 10 years of crisis, and New York is still in crisis. So they have the, the Chicago Fair was very successful for Chicago, so now they want to have a huge fair. It's going to be the biggest World's Fair ever done at, at, to this point. Um, and uh, General Motors turns to this guy to do their exhibit. They want to continue the policy. They, they want the fourth necessity. That's their mission, right? And they want to, this guy to help them expand this idea to make the car the fourth necessity by getting inside of your head. He's like Kettering. That's what he's good at. And he's famous. He's not an architect. He's a designer, just designs things, anything. And he gets famous because he designs a theater set where he turns the whole theater into a cathedral. And that includes going behind the seats to do stained glass, behind the seats to do the smell of the smoke and the incense and the candles. It includes having the actors come out and walk among the seats. He's, he's extremely good at collapsing that hole between the performer and the audience. And remember, that's another one of General Motors' goals. Right? They've been trying this whole time to get closer to the people after the crisis, partly because they want you to have faith in them again and partly because they want to get in your head. So uh, Norman Bel Geddes, the designer, becomes famous for that theater, but he's even more famous for his visions of the future. He publishes a book called Horizons, where he argues that a box cannot go very fast. A circle 
can go a little faster, but the fastest shape of all is like this, the teardrop. And he says, everything needs to be like that if you want to be super fast. And he has an idea for cars and airplanes and trains being extra super fast with this cool shape, but it goes to everything, right? It goes to iron for your clothes. It goes to pencil sharpener, right? It goes to vacuum cleaner and the desk lamp and the cigarette lighter. Things you don't want to go very fast, right? But they all have to look like they're about to go to the freaking moon, right? Because uh, it's that, it's, that's the future. That's, the mo uh, that's modernity. That's progress. We're all going to be a part of this wonderful journey. And so he then gets hired by Shell Motor Oil, another one of these companies, to come up with a vision of the city for the future, the city of tomorrow, what it will be like when we get everything just right. And as you can see, it's a lot of skyscrapers because that's the future, right? And then it's a huge highway, just like the Plan Voisin, blowing through town. And this building is actually the most important one because that's the Woolworth building. That's a real building in New York. And that's the only one left. That building is only there to tell you that he's destroyed all of New York. All of New York's been thrown in the garbage for this future of skyscrapers and freeways just like Le Corbusier planned, and just like General Motors wants so badly. So when, the build, when building the world of tomorrow is announced as the New York theme, General Motors is like, well, obviously that's us. And uh, originally they think, let's just do a really big version of the Chicago one. We'll have the assembly line again, because that was very popular. But then Norman Bel Getty says, no, 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 no. You can do better than that. Don't do the same thing again. Do something different. And I have an idea. I'm going to help you get inside their heads. I'm going to help you break, break through that wall to where you can pull them into your idea of what tomorrow should be for your company. He also designs another little exhibit that I'm only going to tell you about. It's very disgusting, actually. It's nasty. But I'm only going to tell you about it because it's at the same fair, 1939, New York, and it says a lot about Norman Bel Geddes, the way he works. It's a striptease exhibit, and it's a glass chamber of one-way mirrors. Do you know what a one-way one -way mirror is? You can see on, a reflection on one hand, but, but it's transparent through the others. And so he surrounds these poor girls in these chamber of one-way mirrors. They can't see anybody. All they can see is themselves. And the mirrors are, cre are created in such a way that, that uh, all the people who are watching her dance, they can't see each other. All they can see is the girl. And they can see the girl from every possible angle. And so he turns this mass culture experience, this enormous, disgusting event, into something that feels very intimate, feels very close, feels very special. And it just, that's exactly what he's good at. He, create, he, he, he bridges the hole between the audience and the performance. So he, ta he takes that idea. He says, I can do this for you. I can do what I did for the girl. I can do to, to the car for, for, your, for your customers. Um, and I can do it with the futuristic city that I did for the oil company. We're going to do something amazing together. And so General Motors says, okay, Spend as much money as you want. Just make it happen. They just give him a blank check, and he fills it out for like $100 million or something. He spends a huge amount of money. And this, this, uh, this is the, the map of the, of the fair. They build the biggest pavilion for the biggest fair in the history of fairs. The whole building is streamlined, right? The whole building looks like it's about to blast off to the moon, um, and... You see these huge snaking lines? Those things are designed to make the line look long. It's designed to make the line look actually really, really terrible. And indeed, the line was terrible because the show was so popular that people would wait for hours in that line. People would, fall, would pass out in the hot sun because of the line. People would try to, to bribe their way to the front. People would get in fights in the line. The newspapers reported on the line every day. And I, I talked to a man who worked at the fair when he was a boy, and all the people who worked at the fair would say, hey, 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 the line to the, to the General Motors show is short. It's short right now. And then everybody would throw their hot dogs and run to the General Motors thing. 
because it was always so long. So you would wait in this thing for hours. It was hot. It was miserable. It's crowded. And then you would get inside, and you would see a huge map of American traffic conditions, all the terrible roads that we don't have and how everybody's waiting in cars all the time because we don't have good highways. And you, the line would, would, would continue to be brutal, standing. It's hot. It's miserable, crowded. And then you get to the end, and they put you in two, one little chair. A chair for two people, just you and your sweetheart, right? You and your mom, you and your boyfriend or your girlfriend. And then that chair would begin to move, and the walls of the chair completely surrounded you. And so you went from this hot, miserable, uncomfortable, huge experience to something tiny and intimate. And as the chair moved, it then took you in front of a huge landscape, a model landscape with over a million trees, little trees, over 10,000 little lights, mountains, forests, farms, rivers, lakes, oceans, everything. And there was a speaker behind you. He designed a very special piece of equipment, huge, that had a voice that would explain what you were seeing. And he got the sexiest actor on Broadway to do the voice. And it was like, welcome to the future, baby. Um, you're going to have a wonderful time tonight. And uh, is the video going to work? It, I think it will. Yay. So these little chairs would move along. And again, you would see, uh-oh, don't want the, the noise. Is, it, is there a way to make the noise go away? I'll just talk louder. So you have these plains, you have these mountains, you have uh, highways. And the highways had moving cars. Right? The whole thing is mechanized. You have all these amazing streamlined automobiles zipping down these freeways. Right? And then um, you would come to a city. And it, the uh, voice explained to you that the highways had been cut through the heart of town, destroying outmoded business areas, which is to say the old main streets, all the shops. You see any trams? Of course not. The trams have also been destroyed. Okay, shut up. The, train, the trams have also been destroyed. It also says we've gone through the slums, which is to say the poor areas. And a lot of Americans would hear black area, right? Yay, we've gotten rid of the black area. That's exactly what they did, too. So I'm not exaggerating. So, so they come to this amazing, incredible futuristic city with the highways and the, skys and the, and the skyscrapers. And it's such a dark, intimate experience that um, the US Navy asked General Motors not to let their sailors go on it anymore, if that tells you something. It's too much kissy kissy. Um, this is called the Futurama, right? The Futurama, you're seeing the future. And the whole thing is designed not only to give you this intimate view of the future with the sexy voice and the close chair and it's just you and your cutie, it's also designed to feel like an airplane ride. Because these people have never been on an airplane before. That's so cool. That's, that's the future. And so you're, you're literally floating over the world, this future world. And as you enter the city, this is how good Norman Bill Geddes is, the buildings start to get a little bigger. And they get to a little, be a little bigger and a little bigger and a little bigger. And then you come to a, an intersection where everything is super detailed and it's very large. And then the ride ends. It's like you've been landing. You've been landing in the future. And you get off your chair, and you step into a full-scale model of that intersection behind the General Motors building. You're there. You've landed. And they give you a button. I have seen the future. Now, it doesn't say General Motors showed me the future. It doesn't say General Motors makes the best cars. It doesn't say, I'm going to buy a car tomorrow. It says, I have seen the future. And the people who were on this, when they talked to the newspapers, when they recorded their memories, they said that it felt magical. It felt empowering. It gave, made them hopeful. It was optimistic. And yeah, they knew General Motors was a big company. And yeah, they know General Motors sells cars. But they, they felt in, that, in this time that, they, that it really was a kind of team, that they're all on a team. America's a team and that we're going to do this together. 
We're going to make this beautiful world come together. Um, we're going to get out of this crisis, and it's going to be beautiful. It was a huge success. The biggest success of the biggest fair in the history of fairs. Millions and millions of people saw the Futurama. Some of them saw it again and again and again and again. And so General Motors, the first thing they do is they decide how are we going to get it to Florida? How are we going to get it to Texas? How are we going to get it to California? We got to get this thing everywhere. But it's huge. How are you going to get it everywhere? So Norman Bel Getty says, well, we can put it on a, on a blimp. We can put it on a Zeppelin. We can take it to every little town. And the General Motors advertising people love this idea, but the executives think, you're going to explode and kill everybody. So let's not do that one. And so, General Mot so Norman Bel Geddes designs a, a new parade of progress that will create a miniature Futurama. And they're like, nah, it, it won't be that powerful. It doesn't have the chair. It doesn't have the soft stuff. It just, no, it's sorry, Norman. And then Norman makes a really bad mistake. Norman goes, on, goes to the New York Times in the newspaper, and he says, you know, I've been thinking. I'm not sure it's a good idea to put highways in the middle of town. I think we should connect towns with highways, but I don't think it's a good idea to blow them right in the heart of our little towns. They fire him the next day, and they hire Robert Moses to take his place. Robert Moses is the planning director of New York City, and he is Mr. Highway. And he publicly says, Norman Bill Geddes is an idiot for, for suggesting highways should not go through the heart of towns. So General Motors decides, okay, we're going to do a new parade of progress. We're going to take all these Futurama ideas and we're going to make it bigger, but we're not using Norman anymore. Um, he's, he's, he's not playing for our team. And they redesigned the, the vehicles into these super amazing red future liners, they call them. Look at this thing. It's unbelievable. Imagine that coming to your little town. You're lucky if you've seen more than three cows at one time. That thing comes into town and it blows your mind. And indeed, it used to have pure glass on top of it to look like an aircraft, right? But it got too hot, so they had to put a little hood on top. But these things would flood into town again, same old, same routine, right down Main Street, big, big welcome from the city government, everybody's happy, the churches are ringing their bells, the high schools are playing the music, and it's a wonderful event. And then they set up, and now they have these huge fluorescent lights coming out of the top of the future liners. The, the new tent is called the Aerodome, obviously looks a little bit like the airship that Norman Bel Geddes considered bringing to town. And it has an aluminum frame. These people have never seen aluminum before. So it's just unbelievable. And they have, the, they have a lot of the old architecture exhibits, but now made more futuristic. A woman even happier in modern kitchen. Woman even happier in modern living room. A little piece of the Futurama. They have miracles of heat and cold. You know, the old science shows. And then they also have something they call American Crossroads. This is, what they, this is how they take Norman Bel Geddes' ideas and develop it further. American Crossroads was an extremely complex mechanical exhibit that showed a tiny, stupid, pathetic little town transform into a modern glory place with, thanks to highways. And I have a little clip that shows how the pieces would move. And there was a voice explaining everything, explaining, you know, everything was pretty terrible in our little town until they built the highway. And now we're so happy. And yeah, the old folks were complaining. But look, we have modern gas stations. Remember that place used to buy apple pie? Now it's a motor hotel. Look at all the glass. Look at the flat roof. We are so modern. We're so modern. And all these old shops, boom. Now we've got this amazing art modern movie theater. He's so scared. He's going to die. Um, and this, it, the, it flips again, and all the buildings get even more modern, with even more flat roofs and even more glass. And, the, and then the voice keeps saying, that's when we all got rich. Right? And all our happiness never ended, and it was wonderful. And people loved it. They loved it. They were like, ooh, ah, it's amazing. And all the newspapers said, I feel like the Africans must feel when English people come to town. That's literally what they say, right? They feel embarrassed that their, shh, 
little town is so small and pathetic, and that's who they are. But they want to be the really good town with the amazing highway. And they show this thing year after year in all these little places until the war begins. And when the war begins, General Motors has to stop the parade of progress because it's time to make guns and it's time to make airplanes. They're not going to be making any more cars for a little while. But Kettering makes a big speech towards the end of the war. He says, we were doing great. We almost had that, that highway uh, culture. And then Hitler kind of uh, made us take a break. But when Hitler is gone, and he will be gone soon, we will be able to, uh, to finish the job. And he also said, I've also been, been uh, counting lately, and indeed we have made the car the fourth necessity. It happened about six months ago. As of right now, you cannot, you cannot uh, survive economically in America unless you have access to a car at least three days a week. Right. So he, he says, I did it, fourth necessity, it's done. Keep up the good work, boys, and he retires. And then General Motors, after, after the war is over, they, they, they still don't have a federal highway program. They still don't have the government highways. So they put the Parade of Progress out one more time, this time with a new exhibit designed by Robert Moses, the city planner of New York, who will become famous for his highways. And they designed something called Out of the Muddle. It's another one of these mechanical exhibits that changes and flips with a voice. And you have on the left, it's kind of hard to see here, but you have to believe me. They have on the left the traditional town, the town that I wondered what happened to, with the tram, with the walking, with the beer, with the sandwich, with the shop, with the house. And then over here they have the sprawling automobile suburb with a house completely separated from all the other houses, with a church totally separated from the shops, with a huge parking lot. And the whole story is about how everybody was old and stupid there, and everybody here is young and happy and, and rich. And it all happened thanks to the highway and because young people are not so stupid as to get trapped in this stupid old town, they're going to move over there where the future is. And it's going to be great. They, on the other side of the same future liner, they had a city where they said, okay, how do we fix our cities? It's easy to fix the small towns, but the cities we need to destroy buildings more parking lots. We need to make all the streets one way so that it's much easier to drive fast on all the streets. We need to put a highway right through the heart of town. And then at the end, they actually have this completely separate uh, vision of what town planning looks like that goes bum, ba, bum, 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 and rises. And it goes, we're looking even further than tomorrow. We're looking to the next age. And as you can see, these buildings aren't even on a grid, right? They're not even connected to any kind of walkable anything. They're all completely separated from another by highway. This is Plan Voisin. And in fact, you guys are building this shit. We built this shit for years, and you guys are building it on the other side of the, of the Dnipro. Um, and uh, yeah, it, they're also building it in, 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 in Guangzhou, in China. Um, this is Le Cabusier, right? Uh, and General Motors loved it and they knew why they loved it, and they knew why they wanted you to love it, and they're probably pretty happy for Kiev right now. So this is the end, right? The, the, the Parade of Progress had all these exhibits. They took them all over the country. They showed it to 20.5 million people. That's at least one out of every eight Americans, men, women, children. They showed it again and again and again for years. And then when the Federal Highway Act in 1956 was passed, this was a different kind of law. Unlike the Autobahn in Germany, unlike the Japanese highway system, unlike all the other highway systems, this highway system had money to put the, put the roads through the heart of town and to demolish everything. They allocated money for destruction. And the amount of buildings that they destroyed is unbelievable. It's almost more than they built. When this passed, a week later, the Parade of Progress packed up and went home. Mission accomplished. They did it. They set boys to dreaming, which really what they wanted to do was to set them to driving, of course. But they didn't want them to know that. They wanted them to dream that they would be driving. It's so smart. They didn't sell them a car. They're smarter than that. 
They sold them a sense of identity, a sense of place, a sense of hope, a sense of optimism, and, that they, and a sense of power. They sold them a sense of power connected to a car. And now the last thing we have is power because we have to spend so much money on gas and on tires and on our car engines and on the alternator and all the other little pieces that break every, every five minutes that we, don't have, we barely have enough money for the food, clothing, and the shelter. As if that's not hard enough for some people, right? Why, why add another one? But we did it, and now we're really sorry. But slowly we're changing. Slowly we're changing. And if you want to help us change, we have a new graduate program in urban design at the College of Charleston, which is dedicated to, <laughs> to, to building a different world tomorrow. So, <laughs> a new dream. It really is about trams and sandwiches. All right, thank you, guys. You said, even though you said that you hate the thing that happened to your cities and so on, um, do you hate the cars themselves? No, no. I, you know, it's a car can be great. It's like too much of a good thing, right? I like pizza. But if I have to eat pizza every day or I die, I'm going to get mad at that pizza. Right? I like to eat pizza sometimes. I, I love to get in a car and drive in the forest. I love to get in a car and drive under the trees. You know, it's fun. But what I don't like is driving through, through this shit every, every day. Right? It's, it's, it's ugly. It, this destroyed our cities and it destroyed our countryside. We lost forests and farms and fields. It destroyed nature. What, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot, the suburban catastrophe has many different ingredients. General Motors is just one. But the suburban idea argues that you can have the best of both. The best of the country, jobs, money, right, culture, and the best of nature. You can live out with a garden but it actually in many ways gives you the worst of both. You don't get the, the society, the, the community, the walkable scale of city life, and you don't get the intimacy with nature because it's been destroyed by highways and parking lots. So uh, a car by itself can be very good, but too much, too much. And Americans are really good at too much. So may I ask, uh, what is your favorite car? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. Um, uh, the one behind the sea, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's the one in the river. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I have a favorite car. Um, I guess there's a, kind of, there's a kind of boxy silver Mercedes SUV that I could never afford in a million years, but I think it looks kind of cute. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. My, my, my grandfather gave it to me, and I was a really bad driver. And so for years, every time he came over, um, he would just walk. Like the car would be parked out front, and he would just walk around it. Mm. Mm -mm. A little piece here, a little piece there, a little there. It was an eight, it was a, a Buick LeSabre. So it was a huge old person's car, massive, massive thing. I hit everything I could hit with that. My second car was a yellow, canary yellow. You know what a canary is? The little bird, like Tweety Bird, right? Canary yellow Chevy Love pickup truck. Yeah, it didn't even have a radio, right? It was made out of paper, I guess. I looked like Ronald McDonald driving around in that thing. <laughs> It was a disaster. So I have, maybe, maybe that's why I don't like cars. You know? <laughs> maybe it has nothing to do with all this city crap. I don't know. Do you have a favorite car? Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I have. Okay. <laughs> what is it? What is it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, if you know, it's a Nissan a Skyline. Is it a small one, a big one, medium one? Uh, it's like medium. Oh, that's it's small. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, then, yeah. so, sounds, sounds like my kind of car. You don't have to use it every day. <laughs> All right, so uh, and it took so much effort to get people 
come to this dream idea? And do you have any prediction? What, or what can we do to, to, to change this? Is there like it, yeah. survival thing? Like, like they, they stuck in, 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 in this long lines and then they decide, okay, maybe tomorrow I won't use the car. And it, doesn't yeah. happen, it doesn't happen in Kiev, by the way. No. Well, when the price of oil, the price of oil went up a lot a few years ago, and everybody was thinking, we can't do this anymore. I mean, it, our, our country was so addicted to, to, to cheap oil to keep this going. That, I mean, our, our foreign policy was, 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 was insane at times. Um, we were making deals with all kinds of dictators just to keep the oil going and then killing other ones. Granted, they were dictators, but you don't, have, you don't just go around killing dictators for oil. That's not a good idea. So, um, you know, the, when oil prices went up, it changed a lot of minds. People began to think this is not safe. We, we, this is not safe as a country to, to, to depend on this. And of course, pollution is a major issue. But to be honest, the best thing that happened to the American city was the following. The TV show Friends, <laughs> Sex in the City. I'm, I'm telling you, because all of a sudden, all these suburban kids, all these suburban, are watching that and going, oh, that's modern. That's, that's uh, Seinfeld. And they're all in the New York apartment, and they go to the co coffee shop, and all these kids in the su suburbs of Atlanta are thinking, oh my God, that looks amazing. That's, that, that looks like freedom, just like it did for me. And they always have, in all these urban redevelopments, there's a photograph of usually friends walking together, and there's usually at least one woman with shopping bags, and she's going, you know, because she's super just happy to be in the city, and she's got shopping bags, and there's no homeless people in the photograph. But it's good to see a homeless person now and then because it's just like in the films. So TV and film cr created a new romance for the American city, including some of its problems like homelessness and crime. Strange, but it, it drove a lot of uh, demand for urban living in places that had previously had none for 50 years. Uh, I heard in California, uh, there are a couple of, uh, how do you say, this, uh, there are bicycle, uh, bicycles ran, and mm -hmm. this electric scooter ran. Oh, right. It's yeah, very yeah, popular yeah. in uh, this uh, uh, Silicon Valley, Valley and uh, everybody driving scooters and they laying around. Yeah, yeah, even, even a crisis. Yeah, it was a crisis. Change the habit to use cars. Like well, in those cities, like that was mostly in San Francisco right. where you had the scooter thing. San Francisco is very dense. Um, you, can, you can do that. In Los Angeles, you'd be dead in five minutes. If you tried to take a scooter, yeah, yeah, and it's the, and the roads are too big and the cars are too fast. And uh, but there are parts of Los Angeles like Pasadena and Santa Monica that are increasingly walkable. And Los Angeles is building a metro as fast as it can. And wherever the metro stops, urban life is coming back. And so you can take the scooter in those little islands, but you can't take it into the sea. You know, you'll die, you'll drown. The sharks will eat you. Um, so. Yeah, but San Francisco, the scooters were, were a crisis because people, were, like you said, they were just leaving them everywhere. It was this subscription service. You, and so they passed a law stopping it. Now they want to give them another try. But you have to be a dense city to have that scooter life, I guess. Well, in my city, Charleston, it's possible to do it, but um, we're still trying to figure out bicycles. Yeah. Yeah, parts. Parts of it are very dense. Pretty much. Even, even like, living there, areas that are big, they get a dense. Uh, but uh, it's, it's still not common to use bicycles, for example. Everybody mm. thinks it's a crazy idea, not because of road traffic. Uh, Why? But, but also, it's not like our habit. habit and uh, they still get into the car, <laughs> and they drive longer than you could take walking. Strange, yes. yeah, Sometimes that's, strange. I, I don't know, I mean, was it like that before, before 91? I mean, I guess a lot of people were walking before 91, right? They didn't have any money, <laughs> otherwise. Yeah, exactly. And so now they have money and they want to drive everywhere. Yeah. It's like the Chinese are building automobile urbanism as fast as they can, because they feel like they've been left behind. And a, a famous American planner, 
told the Chinese, he said, you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to make the same mistakes we did. And the Chinese uh, official said, we can if we want to. Go home. <laughs> it's our mistake. Yeah. yeah. Plein voisin. Plein voisin. It's modernity. It's a hundred years old now. Modernism is extremely conservative. It's extremely old-fashioned. The walkable city is cutting-edge, awesome, progressive stuff. But, you know, everybody wants to be modern. I think being modern is the least modern thing you can do. So what kind of projects do you do for this program? So this... Um, so Charleston is a very, it's, it's like I mentioned before, it's an old city, it's a very dense city, you can walk around a vast majority of it, but we have really bad public transportation, for example. And that's a big problem because the city is becoming richer and richer and richer every year, and poor people are being pushed out. And it's the poor people who have to work in the hotels, who work in the restaurants, and as they get pushed out of the old city, they have to go out to the crap suburbs that were built in the 50s and 60s. How are they going to get to their job in the, in the walkable city? They could no longer afford. Now, to live in the walkable part is the very expensive part. The suburb is poor. But the suburb is where you have to have a car. So how bitter is that? How terrible is that? That, that you have to buy a car for the privilege of living in a shit place. And then you have to drive in and pay a huge amount of money to park to wash dishes. It, it's terrible, and it's happening more and more in American cities. So, Because our downtowns are coming back to life, and the first ring of suburbs are dying. And that's where the poor move. So we're really pushing to get better public transportation. And everybody says, automated cars, automated cars. But um, Google is going to save us. And this kind of, but uh, there's an MIT planner who said it really well. He said, we don't need driverless cars. We need carless drivers. <laughs> and we need them now. <laughs> so, Here we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So. Maybe we like the tendency that our suburb is like kind of even rich sometimes. So it's not about uh, poor people living in the suburb. It's different here. Well, you, you'll get there. Yeah, you, you will. Yeah. <laughs> you'll have this problem, too. I mean, Podiel is paradise. I mean, the beautiful buildings you have here, the life, the street life. I mean, I wouldn't want to live in some styrofoam box in the middle of nowhere. I have to drive everywhere. Yeah, and also, your metro is amazing. It's so beautiful. Svetlana took me on a magnificent tour today. We went into the metro, and I was like, oh, my God. I almost cried. I have one of the little pla <laughs> Yeah. I, I took one of the little plastic tokens. I'm gonna I'm gonna take it home and I'm gonna sleep with it like this. The tokens? Buy them now, they're gonna be very valuable. Yeah. Yes. Oh it's mine, it's mine. I'm keeping it. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's liberty. You don't have to buy a car. It's very expensive. You don't have to fix the car. That's the thing nobody thinks about. They break all the time. You don't have to put gas in the car and destroy the environment. You don't have to uh, buy tires. You don't have to park. You don't have the stress of traffic or the stress of parking. I mean, it's, cars can be fun, but when everybody has it, it sucks. Right? It's not fun anymore. And, when you have to, and again, when you have to use it every day to live, that's my big problem. I love the car being a luxury. I don't like the car being a necessity. Do you have traffic jams in your city? Oh, yes. How oh, do yeah. I solve that problem? Because we actually have one. Yeah. <laughs> Great one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a big problem because there's one big road that comes in from the northern suburbs, and then one road, because we're on a peninsula. It's almost an island. But we have one road that way, one road that way, and one road that way. And so all those roads get, get jammed. Um, and the, ar you know, the argument is, that's the price. I mean, it's the price of popularity. And it's also the price of depending on putting all your eggs in one basket. Do you have that expression? Yeah. Putting all your eggs in one basket, the car basket. What happens if you drop it? What happens if it gets too full? You've got an egg problem. 
But if you have an egg in this basket, cars, an egg in that basket, bicycles, an egg in this basket, walking, an egg in this basket, trains, then you're in business. You can move the eggs around when you've got problems. Yep, 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 yep. Uh -huh. And, we, you know, we got alligators. That's another problem. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, unrelated. Yeah. We don't put all the alligators in the alligator basket. Yeah. Well, you guys have been really great. Thank you for being so patient in the beginning. Thank you for your questions and your patience with the technical stuff. And sorry for the big file, Vlada. Um, no, no, no. No, I should have brought us. I should have brought a compressed PDF too. It's just common sense. So yeah, sorry about that. You've, you've heard me. They've already heard me so much. They don't want to hear me again. It's a great idea. Well, t tomorrow we talk more about the solutions. Um, and Charleston has some things that are a little bit different from Kiev. Like, we have a big problem with the history of slavery. Charleston was the biggest city for the slave trade in the United States. And so when I talk about the poor people being thrown out, it's the black people. And it's the black people whose, whose grandparents built this city and they don't get it anymore. And so that's one of the reasons why we're so passionate about this public transportation is that it's, it helps address the, the injustice that began 400 years ago with slavery. Right. So um, and we also, I'm also gonna talk about beauty, which is hard to have when you're going you know, 65 miles an hour. Uh, this is not beautiful, partly because you do, why would it be? You're not going to spend time looking at it. It's like outer space. Between the Earth and the Moon, you're not, really, you're not doing that for the scenery. You know, you're going as fast as you can with the music and the phone and hopefully not killing somebody. Uh, but a walkable environment, a walkable city, really needs to be beautiful or people won't want to be there. So I also, and I, I, I actually argue that beauty is a science. It's not just an art. It's a science, too. Um, but that, that's tomorrow. But you, you guys don't have to come. I mean, how, how long have you been here already? It's been like two hours or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, you guys are awesome. Really, thank you so much. Same to you. <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> thank you.